Hey, welcome to Church on the Rise, BYU. It's so good to have you with us online today. We pray that God's Word will enrich you, encourage you, maybe stretch you, but definitely equip you to do the week ahead. We pray for God's richest blessing to be upon you today and that His Word would dwell richly in you. God bless you and enjoy the service. Good morning to our online church and we've got so many people in the room this morning that want to say good morning to you wherever you're watching right around our nation and so let's say good morning to our online church. Brilliant, brilliant, that's good. It's great to have you with us and so today and if you want to uh, check out some of our online platforms on Facebook and Instagram, we've just watched a random act of Christmas kindness. So we're going to put that up. If you're online, then you can be a part of our initiative as well and jump on our Facebook page to check out exactly how you can rack someone this Christmas. Well, the whole rack initiative as we head into Christmas really ties into the fruit of the Spirit, which is kind of a bit of fruit salad today. And we're looking at kindness, goodness, gentleness and faithfulness. Oh, don't get too, too, too into self-control just yet. I mean, that, that's going to come on Boxing Day. And so that's kind of really, really timely that we're going to look at self-control on Boxing Day. As, uh, Mark did a brilliant job at emceeing this morning, and uh, I want to so thank you for your support. And as he shared, our Boxing Day service will be online only. So if you're watching online, there won't be anyone there to go, good morning, and you'll just be... Um, Oh, where, where is that? I wonder what it feels like. Well, you won't get it. So you have to watch some of the, the earlier messages to get that. But we have an incredible service lined up for you on Boxing Day Online. And uh, whether you want to grab some family or friends and, and gather in people's homes and, and watch it in small groups, then we want to encourage you to do that. But you might just be with family and think, well, I'll get to it later in the day. It will be available from 8 o'clock on Boxing Day. And so you'll be able to get in nice and early on that. And uh, it's going to be a great service uh, to be a part of. So I want to commend that to you. But let's jump into the fruit of the Spirit. Let me just remove these. I can see you, but I couldn't see my notes. And so let's pray. Father God, today as we come around your word, Quicken your word in our hearts, we pray, Lord Jesus. Lord, there's so much to glean from your word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak ever so clearly to us. Lord, that you would prompt in us the things that we need to give attention to and the, the areas that we need to allow you to work all the more in our lives. So Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to really skim, okay? We've got to go quick because there's a lot of content to get through. And so what I've also done to help you this morning is I've also provided uh, some notes that I've been reading through and some uh, other theologians uh, have put together. So they're available online. And by the time you get home this morning, you will also have them in your email inbox, okay? And so you'll be able to munch on those throughout the week. But kindness and goodness and gentleness, you know, the thing I'm loving about the fruit of the Spirit is how Christmas it is. It's not fruit cake or, or Christmas slice or anything like that. It's, it's amazing to me that I've never realized this before, and I don't know if you've realized this before, and if you have, or you're a step ahead of me, uh, how much the fruit of the Spirit, which are the attributes and nature of God, are activated at Christmas. It's all who Christ is. It's who God is. And it's the Holy Spirit who Jesus left us with. He said, I have to go so the Comforter will come. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, try you in God in three expressions. It has to be there if the Holy Spirit's outworking this in our lives. And so, you know, peace, goodwill toward men, fruit of the Spirit. And it's the message of Christmas. And, it, and is it any wonder that they've coincided and correlated so brilliantly? Let's look at kindness, goodness and gentleness. They kind of speak for themselves, don't they? To be kind. Oh, what does that look like? 
well, let's, let's put another word in there, grace. Uh, that's what that looks like. When, when someone asks you to do something that you're not totally up on board with, then issue grace on that. Uh, I've told you the story before that while we're driving around in our car and we see an L plate, uh, we actually say in the car, more grace. Uh, it's interesting and now that uh, we have a driver with an L plate on and uh, it's more grace is required. Uh, we were driving down the road and we had to make a, a, a quick lane change. The lane change was brilliant. I mean, it was something I would have done and um, as I instructed the learner to do, and uh, as we just drove on for another 10 metres, there was someone behind us that was incredibly irate that we'd made a quick late lane change. And they're shaking their fist and they're angry and I'm like, there's no need for that. There's no need for that. And it's amazing how angry people get. But if you get pushed into that corner, make sure you come out with kindness and grace. Where when people... Push your buttons. Oh, I saw a great meme the other day. It said, sorry, I was pushing all your buttons. I was looking for mute. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's really cool. And so when it comes to kindness, allow kindness to flow from you by an act of grace. What is um, put on you sometimes isn't kind. And when I look at the life of Christ, what was done towards him wasn't kind. But he enacted grace. And what was that? To go above and beyond. To keep on mission. Don't allow uh, persecution and disappointments and people treating you harshly to take you off course. Because it will. You know, the number of times that, that people will throw your generosity back in your face. And there's a temptation to go, well, I'll never be that kind again. If that's how it's treated or reciprocated. And you can't go there. You've just got to keep fronting up, dusting it off and going, I'm going to be kind again because it will have a different result. And maybe this time it'll be the one that gets in. Maybe this time will be the, the, the point where it cracks. You know, the, there's an old story of hard-working men and they were chipping away at a big rock. And they were saying, which, which hit actually demolishes the rock? Like, breaks it down. Is it the first one? Because you're full of energy and it's... Whack, whack, whack. Is it the last one? Because you're like, I just can't do it anymore. That's the last hit. It's all of them. It's all of them just compounding, compounding, compounding. So don't ever let poor treatment of you stifle the fruit of the Spirit that's activated in your life, especially around kindness, goodness, gentleness. They won't always be favorably reciprocated. Some people just don't know how to receive generosity. And that's okay. So we have to teach them. Some people think the only reason you're doing something nice for them is because you want something in return. I don't know who said it, but it's a famous quote that says that the best way to, to be a blessing is to do something for someone who has no ability to pay it back. And I just think, you know, as we're activating these things, and they, there's a whole article that's waiting for you in your email uh, when you get home, and if you're online, it'll be there a little bit later all about kindness and goodness. They, they call them the, the fruit twins. I mean, in a lot of commentaries I read, they call these two the fruit twins. The characteristics stem from love. It's amazing, isn't it? Someone said this, said it this way. Patience is suffering love. Kindness is compassionate love. And goodness is ministering love. They all work Together. Goodness then speaks of service or ministry to one another, a spirit of generosity put into action, a serving and giving. It's the natural result of kindness, the inequality of tenderness, compassion, and sweetness. And all of this is summed up in the word love. In Psalm chapter 15, in the first five verses, we read how this is enacted out. To live in righteousness whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue. To be kind is who does his neighbour no wrong, casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without keeping dockets of it and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. 
Kindness is a disposition or a willingness to do that which is right or good. Goodness goes a step further than kindness. William Barclay, a theologian, defines it as virtue equipped at every point. I like that. Goodness is virtue equipped at every point. We just want to do good. We know good works. We know that good is far much nicer to receive than a harsh word or a stifling word or a criticizing word. Goodness is virtue equipped at every point. He goes on to compare kindness and goodness. What's the difference? In the Greek, I can't even say this word. I practice this so many times and now you're all looking at me, I don't even want to try. Agathusun. You've got to say it quick. Wheelbarrow. You've got to say it really quick. <laughs> Agathusun. It's goodness. Um, and it, it talks about being right and discipline. So the, the kind of goodness that God brings to us is discipline because it puts us on the right path. Now, goodness isn't always peaches and cream, you know what I mean. It, it's, it's discipline. It's, it's having the goodness to correct. God's Word does that. You know, with our own children, when it comes to discipline, we don't just go, oh, aren't you cute and aren't you wonderful and, and I don't care that you never put your rubbish in the bin or you always leave your things lying around and who brought the mud in from outside? And No, we, we bring discipline and we give thought process. Understanding this through goodness and kindness that a young person's brain is not fully formed. It's a challenge for me because there's times where I bring discipline as though their little hearts and minds are already fully formed. Now, I don't know what it is with girls, but I know what it is with boys. You've got to the age of 24 before this thing is fully sorted out. So even when they're 18, you think, well, they'll never do anything stupid again. Wrong. <laughs> grace, grace and more grace, kindness and goodness discipline by putting them on the right path not I told you so I am so thankful that God never understanding that we are still in development of dealing with the flesh and our spirit never anywhere can I find a verse where God says told you so full of loving kindness he what makes room for us to come in and be gentle with us He's right, and sometimes discipline feels harsh in the moment because we want to self-justify. But when I realize when I come to Christ, I can't self-justify because justification is in Christ alone. He justifies me. I can never take a right position against God because my right position is in God. I abide in Him. And so I don't have to justify myself because he justifies me. And sanctification is the process of becoming more and more and more like Christ. It doesn't happen because I want it to. It doesn't happen because I'm filled with good intention. Today I'm going to make a difference in the world. I'm going to be like Jesus. Yeah, we'll front up tomorrow with the same attitude. And the next day and the next day. And never come home with that attitude going, I failed. The fact that you had that attitude in your heart is success. Because you're mindful of Christ, being aware of his presence, indwelling and where he's leading you to be. So there's so many notes on kindness and goodness that are waiting for you. I want to jump into faithfulness. It's just something out of these four attributes that I really felt God was pressing in on me today and, and that's the attribute of the fruit of faithfulness. I want everyone to say, the Lord is good and does good. For an extra bonus point, does anyone know where that's found in the Bible? It's a sneaky little verse in the book of Nam, Nahum. The Lord is good and does good, and it goes on to say, is a stronghold in the day of trouble. 
If you want to remember a Bible verse, remember that one. The Lord is good. The Lord does good. And he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. One of the great misnomers around faithfulness is that we sometimes in our humanity think that there's a reward for our faithfulness. And yet being faithful is actually the reward itself. I want to say that again, especially in our marriages. Sometimes you'll think that faithfulness is something to be rewarded in your marriage. And yet the reward you're looking for is actually faithfulness itself. In your workplace, you're faithful, you're a good worker. Of course you are. As you're fl flowing and functioning in the fruit of the Spirit, of course you are. You'd be, the, you'd be the boss's apple of his eye. You would be his favoured employee because you know how to serve him. You know how to honour management up the line, even when they're wrong. You know how to do that because you're flowing out of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not about what I think, it's about who I am. I know I'm challenging you now. I'm challenging me. But faithfulness is the reward. I don't, I don't need anything to say, oh, well, you, you were faithful. Here we go. Have the trophy of faithfulness. No, there's no reward for flowing out of the fruit of the Spirit apart from having the fruit of the Spirit activated in your life. Therefore, everyone say, therefore. If that's true, then this is also true. Just because bad things happen to you, it doesn't mean you've been faithless. Because he is faithful. Now this is a challenge. Because we love to bring faithful and faithfulness into our realm. Oh God, I'm saved, so therefore everything will work out good for me. Jesus even said it. It's one of my favorite quotes of Jesus. In this life you will have trouble. I don't want trouble. Do you want trouble? I don't want trouble. And I'll do my best to avoid it. But sometimes trouble finds me. Sometimes trouble finds you. And it doesn't mean that God has been faithless. The Word of God actually says that we can be faithless but he can't be because God is faithful even to himself. Now, it's a challenge that when we go through the peaks and troughs of life, that we're not only faithful when it's all working out. Faithful literally means this. In every season, I have a reason to sing. Because my faithfulness, remember, like all the other facets of the fruit, are not dependent upon, upon my external circumstances. So when things bad happen, do I say he no longer loves me? No, he loves me. And he paid for my life with a powerful price, like Mike so brilliantly shared around communion this morning. I think it was Paul who wrote in Corinthians, we are pushed on every side, we're crushed. But does he mean he no longer loves us if we're fighting peril and sword and calamity? No, he loves us all the more. You just jumped down there, thank you. He loves us. Nothing can take away his love. We're more than conquerors. Everyone say more than conquerors. You're not a, just not a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. Yeah. Don't put a full stop there. Through Christ Jesus. Our salvation is internal fortitude, strength, and resilience. And it can change our external circumstance by how we approach it and walk in it. But if bad things happen... And they will and they do and I don't want them to. But I need them to. To develop my trust and my hanging on to God. Have, have you noticed that your grip gets loose when everything goes really well? Oh God, I'll just let a little bit more string out of my balloon. 
Oh, look, it's going so well. Oh, so wonderful. Whoa, 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 oh, 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 oh. Quick, grab it. <laughs> Bring it back in close. We hold on to God through pain and we hold on to God through trouble and strife. And he rescues us. And sometimes it's a season where it feels like nothing's changing. But it is well with my soul. It may not be good outside of my body, but it is good with my soul. That's what faithfulness is. And we should be constantly asking God for every facet of the fruit. And we looked at, when we looked at patience, we'd say it's the, we, we just don't ask because we know what we're going to get. No, we have to ask for patience. Because if we don't ask for patience and we're saying, Lord, I don't need the fruit of your spirit operating in my life. If I don't ask for long-suffering, if I don't ask for gentleness, if I don't ask for kindness, if I don't ask for love, if I don't ask for peace, then I'm saying, God, I don't need your Holy Spirit operating in my life. And we need it all. But faithful speaks about going above and beyond. And it's not determined about what's happening to us. It's about how we determine what we're happening to. Remember we preached a series a little while ago. Hey, trouble, you're in trouble. Why? Because we don't want trouble happening to us. We want to be happening to trouble. I want to be able to happen to trouble. I want to be full of the Holy Spirit so when trouble comes my way, I'm so, so glad to meet you. I've got something for you. Some fruit. The sweetness of God from holding on. It's not easy. So we could say, Pastor Aaron, you make it sound so easy. It's not easy. It's incredibly difficult. I remember going to a primary school fates when this was kosher and we used to have to catch a greasy pig. Uh, it's not kosher anymore. And I want it said clearly online that we have not done that for 100 years. <laughs> and I'm only 50 of those. Uh, <laughs> not kosher, but see, it was fun. But all you wanted to do was catch the pig. And every time you thought you had him, <laughs> slippery little sucker, away you go. It's hard sometimes to be faithful because our humanity wants faithfulness to look like that our external factors are all in a line and all working out. And in fact, if your external factors are upside down, inside out and all over the shop, that's the best time to show faithfulness on show. Faithfulness comes from the inner working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Faithfulness is holding on to God in spite of our circumstance. Being faithful speaks of going above and beyond what's happening to us. In other words, I don't only show up when I'm happy. Have you ever said those words, oh, I don't know if I could go to church today, just, just don't have the feels. No, well, faithfulness says you should. If you're well and able, faithfulness says you should. It's only two times you need to come to church. Only two. In the whole course of the year, 52 times a year should you be in church. But there's only really two times you need to come to church. The first one is when you feel like it. Because there's people that you can bless by being in the house. Second time is when you don't feel like it. <laughs> only two times. Because there's people that can bless you when you least feel like coming to church. Sometimes we think coming to church is all, all about God. And we don't do it for God, we do it for us. And what we do when we get here is all about Him. But we needed this. And it's amazing what you'll find happens when you have a cup of coffee later. You'll be ministered to. And it's wonderful. So what is faithful? That I don't only, what's it look like? I don't only show up when I'm happy. That I only serve when I have the feels. No. That I respond well when I'm corrected. That I honour leadership when I don't get what I want. Faithfulness comes from a place of conviction. It's a choice. As for me and my house, I have decided to serve the Lord. That's a conviction. And so 
doesn't matter whether everything's well in my household, whether everything's challenged in my household. As for me and my house, what have you decided in your house? What are the convictions? Faithfulness comes from a place of conviction. In every season, I have a reason to sing. Though the fig tree doesn't blossom, there'll be no fruit on the vine, no herd in the stall, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I'm not thanking him that the vine's empty. I'm not thanking him that there's barrenness in the stall. I'm not allowing my external factors to dictate to me whether I'm going to be faithful or not. When I choose to be faithful, I determine that I will be ready for whatever comes my way. I'm not ambushed. I may not have expected it. I may be shocked. I may be disappointed. But I'm going to choose to be faithful. For me, one of the ways that I test faithfulness in my own life is around the tithe. Because it's a conviction. So my tithe is related to my income. Your tithe, biblically speaking, is related to your income. Take a tenth of your income, whatever it was that week. And so is it a stretch? Yes. Are there moments where I've actually sat down and thought... That tithe would be better off in my bank account this week than in God's storehouse. Have I ever thought that? Of course I have. There's moments where I have to step over the line and go, I'm stepping over in faith. What does tithe do? It proves my faithfulness to need God. That's, that's what it does for me. This is why I give. Because it proves my faithfulness to need God. God... I need you to, right now. And I stop there. It's not, Lord, I need you to come through for me right now. He's already come through for me. That sounds a little bit like a comic strip voice. He's already come through for me. <laughs> well, I'm just chasing you, diggity dog. He's already come through for me. And I hope he's already come through for you. I'm getting a little bit wild west right now. But faithfulness... It shows up most in the things that require more than words. And my giving, when I bring it into the storehouse, requires more from, than words. Faithfulness requires more than good intention. Oh, I wanted to be faithful. Oh, I was going to be faithful. That's just good intention. Faithful is, I'm going to be faithful. I don't only tithe when things are going well. I don't only tithe when I have excess. It's a conviction. Faithfulness is a conviction. I give because God is faithful. I give in faith. When I bring my offering into the storehouse, I actually give in faith. I'm saying, Lord, I'm acknowledging everything that the week was. From what you've poured into my life, I'm saying thank you. And I can't change what's been. But I can step into tomorrow with faith by saying, God, this offering isn't only for yesterday, it's for tomorrow. And I'm going to step forward and walk in faith as a conviction. And I want to say to you people, thank you for your faithfulness to God's house. See, every week as a church, and as we manage the church finances, we give in faith. There are so many things that are going on from a budget viewpoint. We have faith goals each week as a church. Money comes in for our mission support. We've got people that right across the globe that we give into as a church and support the missions, the, the ongoing work of Christ at work, gospel going out to the nations of the world. You're a part of that. But we have a faith statement and so we need certain amount of dollars to come in every week so we can keep our commitment. It's faith. To meet our commitments to the community. It takes faith to do that. The faithfulness of God coming through this house to be a blessing to our local community. We need faith to believe for our building, for our mortgage will be covered each week. We need faith to believe that I can pay my staff wages this week. It's a faith ministry. And as we go into Christmas, we need to maintain our faithfulness to God's house. This is probably one of the toughest periods in terms of our church budgeting because we know what happens at Christmas. Holidays, 
presents, things are tight, money gets, if it's not a conviction, money will jump ship. Oh, that's my tithe, hang on a minute, I need that. If it's a conviction, I don't need that, God needs that. And I need to give in faith. I'll be honest with you, there are some weeks we don't get enough in to cover all of these responsibilities. But it's faith and we're going to keep trusting in God. We're going to keep giving our best. And some, sometimes you might feel like it's a hard sell up here. But there are things to keep those doors open, quite literally. And in, in the last few weeks, we've had to have those doors repaired, replace air conditioning in the youth and children's room, replace air conditioning in the foyer. And if you're wondering why it's warm in there, it just hasn't happened yet. Because... There's not enough beans to put in the bean counter. And so some of it's workmanship, some of it's labour, some of it's parts, some of it we've bought an old building. And some of it we, we pray, man, when we call a trading in, it's like, oh, Lord, not this time. Can it last just a little bit longer? And he'll say words like, if it's this part, you'll be okay. If it's this part, you're going to need a whole new door. And that's thousands and we're like, Lord, can it just be this part? <laughs> well, some of those parts aren't working anymore, and so we're still trying to ascertain what the problem is in there. So I'm not saying that to make you feel sad and sorry. I'm just saying, uh, collectively, faithfulness is a conviction, and this, what we do here, is a faith ministry and requires faithfulness to God's house, that it's not conditional on my external circumstances it's a commitment according to God's word and what I've decided as for me and my house but let's let's move apart from giving it's not just in our giving it's in our attendance and if we can't be in the house it's in clicking on with this finger you just go click click and join our YouTube channel and if you've not subscribed to that what that does is helps you find online church a whole lot easier Make sure you're faithful to those times and spaces. And now this time is set apart for God. This time is set apart for God to speak into my life. God's faithful. He uses people around us to be a blessing. It's a whole rack somebody this week. But you know, there's so many faithful stories in the Bible of people who wrestled with their faithfulness. Do you ever find you wrestle with your faithfulness? Well, it's not a bad thing. To wrestle with your faithfulness people in the bible had the challenges john the baptist didn't think jesus was quite moving at the pace he should have been i thought you were the messiah i thought you came to bring change i thought this was going to happen by now why are you taking your time he was challenged peter the very same peter who had the revelation from heaven oh you are the rock you are the son of god <laughs> boom I never knew him. It wasn't me. Oh, no, I wasn't with him. I don't know. Who are you talking about? No, that bloke. No, nah, not me. Got the wrong fella. They struggle with their faithfulness. And at times we struggle with our faithfulness. But don't write yourself off. Just get back up on that faithful horse and ride it again. Gideon had challenges. Jonah, Elijah, Thomas. We, you know, we hang it on Thomas. We hang it on Thomas that he had to be the one to say, unless I see, unless I see it, I won't believe it. None of the disciples believed it. And yet Thomas, we always hang it on Thomas. They all had to see it to believe it. And Jesus appeared to the 11 and then he came back and appeared to Thomas. How faithful is God? You know, Jesus could have literally said, well, I'll go prove myself to someone else. The 12 that walked with me couldn't be bothered working it out, so they didn't even believe I could come back, so I'm going to go back somewhere else. No, he was faithful and go, you know what? I'm going to prove myself there. Still one struggling? Well, I'll come back, just say, help him get over the line. Abraham, Sarah struggled with faithfulness had the promise of God, and then thought the way to do this is through a maidservant and brought so much complexity and calamity into her world by trying to race ahead of God and solving the problem herself rather than just being faithful. And then God brought Isaac. 
and then challenge the whole thought again and say, I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. Hey, Dad, we got the wood, we got the fire, we even got the rocks for the older God. I mean, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Hey, Isaac, just come up here for a sec. Why are you tying my hands together, Dad? It'll, it'll be all right, it'll be fine. Hey, Dad, why are you putting me on the thing? Isn't that a ram in the thicket over there? Whew. What, what does that show? That as we're faithful, he is faithful. And he didn't have to sacrifice his son. But as he is faithful, we're faithful. As we're faithful, he is faithful. And the supreme, Jesus himself, struggled with faithfulness to the point of the cross. Faithful doesn't mean everything will work out the way I want it to, which gives me even more reason to hold on to God. Remember, God is faithful. When we wander, when we drop the ball, when we get disappointed, when we give in to sin, God is faithful. Psalm 33 verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in what? Faithfulness. How good is that? Psalm 91.4, his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Not a butler, a buckler. Isaiah 25.1, O oh Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Do you know that's the key to that verse? Plans formed of old. That's the whole key to that verse. Do you know what that actually means? God is faithful. Because through the humanity and, and life experience, because we've all been made with a free will and people were wrestling with their God call and living on planet Earth, Isaiah is saying here, you stay true to the original plan. You didn't depart from it. We did. And we came back to you as faithful. But thank you, Lord, because you stuck to the plan. And I want to commend you in that. Understand that God keeps to the plan. Faithful and sure. Lamentations 3. Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Isn't that great? For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your what? Faithfulness. Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Have you ever noticed that the first thing to go when, you, when you're sort of on the faithless slide, the first thing to go is this? But it's actually this. Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. And so whenever you catch yourself, did that sound faithful what I just said? Did that make God sound faithful with what I just said? Check your heart. God, I don't know where that came from. Renew a right spirit in me. Of course, when you come back to the fruitfulness of my heart towards you, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. Amen. Come on, why don't we stand? I want to give you three tips on how you can win. Faith is putting your trust in God because God's bigger than you. And when your faith is being challenged... Questions come up and we wrestle with it. Well, what does that mean when that happened? And because that happened, does that mean God no longer? No. It means there's an opportunity for God to be faithful. Because it's not about us getting everything we want. And sometimes that's quite harsh and sometimes that hurts. But three quick things. Three things you can do to win your wrestling match with faith. First one is remember. 
Psalm 77 verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. What does that do? God's been faithful in your past. There have been things that God has shown up in. And it's so vitally important for you to go back and revisit those things. You know, we talk a lot about not looking back in the rear view mirror, but this is healthy. When, when we say don't look back in your rear view mirror, we're saying don't get back into your sin where you thought you weren't good enough. Steer clear of that one, but go back to those monuments and pillars in your past. You're going to hear more of this in the coming weeks. And remember those things. God, you were faithful there. God, you were faithful there. God, you were faithful there. And how many of you know if God's been faithful before, he'll do it again. We say he'll do it again, but it's who he is already. Let's take us out of the picture. God's already done everything he said he was going to do. So in the process of time, we're not waiting for him really to do any more than he said he's already going to do. The only thing we're waiting for is the timing of the Lord's return. And we need to make sure we're ready for that. Not sitting back going, well, is it happening? When's it happening? It's happening. And, and the truth of that is, it, it's said that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And we go, oh, well, we, we'll never know. Read the next two verses. He won't come like a thief in the night to those who are in Christ. Okay, let's sidetrack. Um, how do you win? Remember the deeds of the Lord. Remember them. What, what, what are the good things you've done, Lord? Remind yourself of God's promises, prayers he's answered in your life and have those personal history moments as points that you can draw from. Secondly, remain. So remember, remain. Like a child reaches for a parent when they're scared, we can choose to reach for God through prayer and worship, reminding ourselves he's bigger than our opponent. Listen to what it says in John 15 verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to remember. We need to remain. Can I just encourage you around the fruit? Because we've only got one more left after this. We use, and you shall know them by their fruit, as a success quotient based on performance. I can't see that in Scripture. Well, what's actually being said there is, you will know them by their fruit, not their effectiveness, their success, their work ethic, or anything like that. You will know them by their fruit about how they abide in Christ. Sometimes you'd be around Christians and you hear how they speak, and, you get, and just to yourself, not judgy, judgy, but you're just going, maybe they haven't spent much time with God lately. Because I'm surprised they said that or I'm surprised they acted that way. But don't use it as a point, use it as a mirror and say, God, how am I doing? So we've got to remember, we've got to remain, and we've got to reach. Sometimes we need to ask for prayer or seek the counsel of a friend or a pastor, and we've got our prayer team that are happy to stand here with you at the close of today's service and have some of those needs ministered to, where the body of Christ building up each other is what we're called to to do come on let's just hold our hands out father god we want to be a church that you are happy with and pleased with lord we want to delight ourselves in your ways your plans and your purpose and lord we need your holy spirit activated in our lives lord we need these fruit lord and i pray that it would be our goal that when we hear that phrase, and you shall know them by their fruit, that we would be known by the fruit of the Spirit that's activated in our lives. Help us to always show kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, Lord God. When we struggle with it, Holy Spirit, help us. When we feel less than, strengthen us, Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God. Lord, that we would be truly known as people who are faithful, not just filled with good intention, but Lord, with good follow through in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 
We want to thank you today for being with us throughout our online service and we hope you've gleaned something from the Word of God that will help you move forward in this week. Well, here at Church on the Rise, we are committed to helping you discover Jesus in all his fullness. And if today through anything you've heard, you're wanting to respond to Christ by giving him the Lordship of your life, then why don't you contact us through our email address, wecare at cotr.org.au. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to be able to put you on the right pathway to enhance your spiritual relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Well, we want to encourage you this week to do all you can to stay connected to Jesus, read your Bible, make sure you're taking some time out to pray. And we look forward to seeing you either online or in the building next Sunday. Let me pray a blessing over you before you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to be towards you, his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Like I said, if there's anything that you want to know about our church or find new ways to connect with our church family, then please drop us a line at wecare at cotr.org.au. God bless you.